Welcome to our online sermon. I changed locations on you this week. We'll see how this works. I don't know if I'll stay here or not. I just like change. I get tired of doing the same old things all the time, the same old ways. How about you? Be that way? We're going to continue our study in the book of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 10 through 12. So in verse 10, you are witnesses, and so is God. How devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave toward you believers. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging, imploring each one of you, the Father with his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Father, we thank you for this word. Make it a living word in us today. Make it a word that transforms us and changes us into the people you want us to be. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Talk about behaving today. I ran across an old verse that goes like this. One ship sails east, one ship sails west. Regardless of how the wind blows, it is the set of the sail and not the gale that determines the way we go. I remember every year we used vacation in Corpus Christi and we'd stay right there on the beach of, uh, called, uh, what was that called, North, Mo North Motel. And the waves would hit against the rocks there and we would watch the boats. Many of them were sailboats, big sailboats. One would go one direction, the other would go the other direction. Always thought sailboats had to go the way the wind blew. It's how you set the sails. And that would be an example for us. Setting the sails would be symbolic of our behavior as Christian people, our behavior as Christ followers. Because it's not so much what we say as much as it is what we do. And what we say is important, but it's only important in that what we do backs up what we say. What we say. What we, too many, what we believe determines our behavior. Our behavior determines if we are believable or not. Put that into a Christian perspective, and what we believe about Jesus determines our behavior. If he's Lord, you will behave like he wants you to. Our behavior determines if, if who we are in Jesus is believable or not. Behavior is our lifestyle. Is your lifestyle in Christ believable? It will be believable if you live the way he wants you to live. Summer of 1805, a number of Indian chiefs and warriors they encounter of Buffalo Creek, New York. They were there to hear a Christian message by Mr. Cram of the Boston Missionary Society. After the sermon, Red Jacket, one of the leading chiefs, gave this response. Brother, we are told that you have been preaching to the white people in this place. These people are our neighbors. We are acquainted with them. We will wait a little while and see what effect your preaching has upon them. We find it does them good, makes them honest, and less likely to cheat Indians. We will then consider again what you have said. We need to understand that people are watching us. People are paying attention to us. So it doesn't matter how we live. It doesn't matter what we do. Francis of Assisi said, Do all you can to preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. What he's talking about there is that your life should be an example, should be a proclamation of the good news of Jesus Christ. Like Paul said in verse 10, and we read a while ago, near witnesses, and so is God how we behave. Behavior is noticed and seen, mostly because our behavior always affects other people. Now a question must be asked that you must answer. How does your behavior influence others? Does it influence them to follow Jesus, or does it turn them away from him? Does it know that we are to live in such a way that draws a loss to Jesus to give people no ground of accusation against us and our faith. And we can't get that settled among God's people, then we will never be able to take to people without Jesus and have a credible witness. Does your life match your words? That's a good question. For some, it is tragically a yes. Your life is a waste and your, your actions do match your words. And for some, it's tragically a no. Your witness is taking a beating. 
God is our witness. Above all, we are answerable to him. Why? Because God sees deep within the heart. He sees our actions, but also knows our hearts. He knows our intents. Now, what Paul did here is he gave three terms to describe what is expected and demanded of Christians in relationship with one another. He said, you know, devoutly we behave toward you, believer. That word devoutly means separate from selfishness and sin. And there is a difference in there between sinning and, be and being controlled by sin. All of the sin, all the struggle with sin. But you are not to be controlled by any sin. You are to walk away from that. You are to be devout. You are to be faithful to your God. This means you are consistently godly. You know, we used to have uh, one of those things called an oscillating sprinkler. You go back and forth, oscillate, back and forth, back and forth. It's a lot of fun to play in. It's not, the, not a lot of fun when that's your Christian experience. When you're back and forth, when you go behave the way you want to, and you move over here and behave the way Jesus wants you to. You move back over here and do what you want to do, and you move back over here and do what Jesus wants you to do. There's no power in that. There's no, there's no good news in that at all. There's no change in that. The second term he used is the word uprightly. Uprightly. Fundamentally, that means we're conformity to God's revealed will refers to moral correctness, to doing what God defines as just and good. Not what we define, but what God defines. See, you can't decide for yourself what's right or not. You have to let God tell you. And God tells us in his word how we're to live. And then the word blamelessly, the third thing he said. Not moral perfection, but a life characterized by godly habits. You will never be a perfect person this side of heaven, but you can be a godly person this side of heaven. Up to date in your relationship with God and with others. I think of this blamelessly. I think of Daniel, who had been taken from to, into exile from when the city of Jerusalem fell at Nebuchadnezzar. He was taken into exile to back to Babylon. And there he, he just uh, continued to improve and to be promoted where he was really the most, second most important person in the kingdom of Babylon. But he was so good at it, the others, other governors, the other rulers were jealous of him. They wanted to find a ground of accusation against him. They looked into his business affairs, they looked into his personal affairs. Scripture said they could find nothing to charge him with, nothing against him. And the only thing they found was that he was overly committed to his God. Isn't that great? Wouldn't you like to be, that to be told about you, that you were overly committed to your God? That he was so important to you that he, he meant everything to you? That's how they trapped him. They, they talked the king into making a law. If anyone prayed to anybody other than the king for 30 days, they would be thrown into a lion's den. But Daniel just kept right on doing what he did. Not, not to be rebellious, not to be arrogant, but to spend time with his God. And he was thrown into a lion's den and God spared him. God shut the mouth of the lion. So he was blameless. See, righteousness is first internal, and then it's second horizontal. When we're righteous, we will practice it, and we will live it before others. We will not live it privately. It starts out vertical, but it's lived out horizontal. So it says, blessed are you in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are you when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you're going to be a godly behavior, you're going to have a godly person be with godly behavior. You have to have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. You have to consume your life. Now, Paul also used three terms to describe the manner in which our behavior is passed on. He used the word exhorting. He said, you know how we were exhorting each one of you. This is a heartfelt term. Now, one time shot in the arm to make someone feel better. The strong support that imparts courage to others, helping others be bold in what is right. There is strength in numbers, isn't there? And we need to have those numbers. Be more and more people, more and more Christians need to be bold in Christ. Then the second term he used was encouraging. That word means coming alongside, staying alongside someone as they experience failures and distresses in life. Sometimes people would never be godly if it wasn't for someone there to pick them up and to encourage them. It's a lost art today. We have plenty of discouragers, plenty of complainers, plenty of groaners. We don't have too many encouragers, do we? 
It's almost an epidemic. Maybe maybe never more Christ-like than when full when full of compassion for those who are needy, discouraged, or losing up for God. And then he used the third term he used was the term imploring. That's having a clear vision of what's right and leading a person through their maze of emotions and conflict so that they can confuse an issue, giving direction to them. And some people can't take direction. Some people can't take direction. But we need to do that. Paul says we are like a father with, with his children. Earlier, he talked about being a mother, like a mother, nurturing and caring and loving. Now here's a father's strength, a father's love. You want to know what kind of father you ought to be, you ought to look to God and emulate him. But it is that we are to be those kind of people. And this is for each one, by, by the way. Because we were, verse 11, we were encouraging, imploring, exhorting each one. Each one. Standard behavior and impact on the world is for every Christ follower, not a special few. Now there is a couple of reasons why this matters. First of all, one, we are to walk in a manner worthy of God. It says that in verse 12, so you would walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom. In other words, not gained by, nothing second rate, nothing less can be offered to him who gave his son for us and all that we have and all that we are. Now to understand, we must view God and ourselves accurately. God determined to create for himself a people who would bear his character and his nature, who would live out his will. But man sinned and rebelled and messed it all up. Yet God has constantly pursued mankind. God has constantly pursued us, revealing his personhood, his justice, his love, and his mercy. He pursued us for his glory and to bring us back to himself, what was rightfully his. Jesus is the extreme effort God went to to bring us back to him. So it makes it so critical and crucial that we live a life worthy of him. That doesn't mean that we earn things from God. It just means that we love him and we follow him and we want to bring glory to him. So God's calling our lives and his purpose for us is to make us like Christ. We are the presence of Christ in this age and this, in this world. The only Christ that some people ever see will who they see in us. So you believe the message, they must trust the messenger. Are we living in such a way that matches the worthiness of that call? We've been called to be Christ's people. Are we living in such a way that matches that? Second reason that we're to behave this way is for his glory. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 31, probably the Hall of Fame verse here. Whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Those of us who follow Jesus will be welcomed into heaven. Meantime, before our glory is realized, we are to be like him, we bear his character and his nature, and we are to bring glory to him. We need people to see Jesus in us. Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see God in you and glorify your Father who is in heaven. We use that in our baptism. When we hand a candle to people, we say, you are the light of the world, now go and shine. Let people see Jesus in you and glorify your Father who is in heaven. The choice is yours. Are you living lives worthy of his plan and his promise? Or are you living according to your plan, according to what you want to do? There's very little promise there, very little power there. But there is nothing that you can do to make a difference in anybody's life with your plan, with your plan, with your plan. God's plan will use you to give you meaning and purpose and impact and power into your life and into the world. Behave. Behave. Set yourself, set yourself to go with God. Sometimes you go against the wind, sometimes you go with the wind, but set yourself and go with God. Father, for everyone who's listening today, pray that they will be, they will take these words of heart, that they will embrace them, and they will make them their own. Pray this in the name of our blessed Savior. Amen. May God bless you.